All right. All right. Um, so now we're gonna we're gonna move on to the IP and the loss functions. Um, let me say a little bit before we actually get going about a kind of uh, difference in methodology here. So I'm not going to give you a representation theorem in the way that Ben did. I'm not going to tell you how to like start from an agent's utility function and then expect to utility maximize this utility function and build a scoring rule that captures how well she thinks different you know, groups of forecasts or credences or whatever language you want uh, are already guiding decisions. Um, it's going to be the scoring rules that we're going to construct are structurally similar to the Sharpish construction of strictly proper scoring rules. Um, but what I'm going to try to do is kind of tease out uh, the, the scoring rules that came well together with the coherence axioms and updating rules, conditioning sets of desirable examples that we already know and love. See which scoring rules what they would have to look like to be able to kind of visit hates or at least hang together uh, in some way, be part of an argument for those things. Uh, so that's the, that's the overall strategy. Let me start by telling you, we're gonna talk about accuracy for IP, which class of IP models, we're gonna be focusing on sets of almost desirable gambles. So, uh, sorry, I should get rid of this thing. I can see everything. There we go. All right, so we're only gonna be working in finite sample space. A little bit of our finite sample space. Um, and again, we have gambles to find on this sample space. There are certain rewards. This is just, it's been a while since Monday. I'm gonna go over very quickly some of the stuff in Harris lecture. Um, we're, I'm just going to, I'm not going to do this in full generality. Arthur, Arthur uh, will be unhappy with this. He, I mean, we shouldn't pick a coordinate system if we don't have to, right? I should be doing this more generally, but I want the problems to be kind of straightforward for you. So we're going to work in RM here. So gambles are vectors in RM. Each of the, each of the elements of vector are the payouts in the different points of the sample space for different worlds. Um, and remember, a set of desirable gambles here, almost desirable gambles, is just a subset of Rn, um, and it's coherence, just in case it satisfies these, uh, these five axioms. So we don't want to include anything that's guaranteed to lose you utility. So it's got to exclude the, the negative orphan. Um, and so this, I'm going to use capital X here. I know I said, oh, I did use X here. I'm going to use capital X for gambles or variables and the small X's for their the values that they take in different worlds. Uh, so we want to never have any of the ones that are guaranteed to be bad in our set of desirable gambles, almost desirable gambles. Anything that is guaranteed to never lose utility, you want to include those. Yeah. So we apply the second. Um, why that? Um, on its own, or in conjunction with the other X? I mean, on its own, it doesn't because we could just have the empty set. So what does that say? If we're looking at gambles on heads or tails, everything in this quadrant has to be in the set. Everything in this quadrant has to be out of the set. And I, we're, we have positive homogeneity. So if we take a desirable gamble and we just scale the utility by a positive constant, that thing is also almost desirable. Um, Activity. So if we take two desirable gambles, then there's some is desirable. And this is this is the most distinctive part of almost desirable gambles. It says uh, if 
if adding any, you know, sweetening any small amount to the gamble makes it almost desirable, then it counts as almost desirable. What, in effect, this is going to do is make sets of almost desirable gambles be closed, convex conflicts. Okay, so the boundaries are always in. We could have done this with strict desirability, so the boundaries are always out. Uh, doesn't matter, but the story rules that we're going to construct, they're just not sensitive enough to handle boundary behavior. So we need to make one choice or another, just include them all or not include them. We're going to need more fine precision tools that we want to really talk about desirability. Um, okay, so question, which one of these is a coherent set of desirable gambles, but not a coherent set of almost desirable gambles? Pick out that one. Given our previous comments, it's that one uh, because it, it doesn't have a closed boundary over it. So, this is going to be corresponding to an infinitesimally biased coin. Um, that kind of stuff is not the kind of behavior that we're going to be able to capture in, in this program. Yeah. The, the one on the, on the right video that it doesn't have zero in it. Oh, sorry. That should, that should have zero in it. So that, that, good. Yes. It's also, it's also not a. I can point to the laser. You. Is it the open house space? No. The open house space? It's not, but it doesn't. I only use dash for the open, so this is a closed task. Oh, that's not <laughs> uh, Okay. Well, let, let me give you a little uh, excuse here. I outsource my tricks to Arthur. Arthur made these four sets of the set. No, he didn't get it wrong. He did it right for the application, and then I just flipped it in and went blind to the text that he put underneath. Okay, so definitely not open house spaces. That would be uh, that would be if we chosen to to do strict desirability, uh, and then that whole boundary would be out. Okay, good. Close. Closed convex cones. That's what we're working with. Of course, as Herb mentioned, and many of you know from Wally, there's a one to one correspondence between lots of these IP models. So we could equally well use our IP scoring rules to talk about accuracy for coherent lower provisions or almost desirable gambles, or we could work with preference orderings. Herb gave you this kind of way to translate between desirability and preference as long as preference is a vector order. Uh, so we could use those, we could talk about those preference orderings, or we could go strict and exclude the boundaries uh, and use strictly desirable gambles or strict partial preference orders. This is good for all these models and stuff we'll do today. Um, but uh, I think the intuitions about how to construct these scoring rules are clearest when we're talking about desirability, so we're going to go with desirability. Okay. Teddy. Just one thing, a small point. I don't want to spend a lot of time on boundaries, which is what we were. Yeah. But while we're talking boundaries, you're you're assuming you have closed boundaries, but I don't need closed boundaries for uh, desirability. I have open sets of probabilities. If I think the coin is biased for heads, but not by any fixed amount, then the fair coin, then then the even money gamble will be strictly desired. Yeah, I, I mean all. All I want is that we don't, we have all the boundary behavior the same. And that's what I'm saying, because the boundary can be, the boundary can be open. I have a close, depending on whether I've got the open or closed set of probabilities. If I have an open set of probabilities, I can expose boundaries. Oh, so this is about the coherent model of provision. Yes. Points. Um, so I, look, let's just agree that the boundary questions are delicate. The boundary questions are delicate. Uh, I am not delicate. Teddy is. Um, I mean, not, not, not in that. <laughs> he's nuanced intellectually in a way that I'm a, a, a brutish ogre. Um, but yes, I agree. Um, so let's let's agree to work with close convex. Uh, sorry, uh, close convex cones here. Um, I'm going to get. A little bit philosophical for a moment, but not because I want to uh, make you listen to philosophy, um, but because I think it's uh, there's some resistance to thinking 
the way that we tend to think about sets of almost desirable gamble thing is capturing preferences of some sort. Um, there might be some resistance to talking about them being accurate or inaccurate or in error. Um, so let's say something a little bit more precise about the interpretation of sets of almost desirable gambles. Um, typically, we're thinking of these things as paying out in some commodity that's linear in utility for you. Um, and so if dollars uh, or if pounds are linear in utility for you, then um, then this is true. If we, if they're not, then we pick some other currency that's linear utility for you, maybe tickets in a lottery or something like that. Um, and then we think of uh, if we're behaviorists, then we treat belief as kind of reducible to preference. So we say, well, believing that a gamble is, gamble is almost desirable is just, it's nothing more than preferring G plus epsilon. Uh, over the status quo or any positive epsilon. Okay, but we, if that's our view, and I take it that is what you think, lots of you, when you think of desirability, um, you might have a kind of human concern or similar to a human concern. You might think, well, look, um, uh, reason serves desire, not the other way around. It's not, I mean, it's not contrary to reason for me to, uh, to prefer the destruction of the world to the scratching of my finger. I can have whatever preferences I want and I'm not rationally impunable, maybe so long as those preferences make me coherent. There's nothing more to say over and above uh, that in, in terms of uh, them being correct or incorrect. That's just that maybe it's a category mistake or something. Um, and I, so I want to address that one point, move on to this quickly, it doesn't matter so much as none of the formalism forces us to adopt a behaviorist interpretation of sets of desirable gambles. Now, lots of the justification for coherence, you might think, goes out the window once you pitch behaviorism. Um, but in principle, you could have these paying out in some, you could have these variables be just uncertain prospects that deliver some quantity that's measurable in say a, a ratio or interval scale. Um, so I could have uh, I could have temperature gambles. You know, if this is a if this is a wonky, uh, I mean this is in fact a CO2 monitor, but say this is a, a wonky <laughs> temperature control uh, thermostat, um, I might think, oh, I'm, I'm kind of uncertain what's going to happen if I press this. Uh, maybe it'll Maybe it'll raise the temperature, maybe it'll lower the temperature. Who knows? There's frayed wires in there and so on. Um, and we might write out that gamble as, as yielding different uh, quantities here, temperature measured in some scale. And I might just think look, we're complex systems, complex functional organization. We have behavior outputs, but maybe you think. Um, you can't read off the functional organization of our minds from that. There are these uh, functional states that deserve the name belief, and I'm just going to take those as primitive. Maybe they cause me to have preferences and cause me to make decisions, and maybe they give me reasons to make decisions, uh, but they don't just reduce to my, my preferences. So I could treat them as their own kind of state, beliefy states. And I could say that uh, believing that G is almost, desirous, almost desirable is a kind of doxastic judgment that I make, a believe judgment. Doxastic is just philosophy speak for belief. Uh, and in that case, I believing that it's desirable, something like expecting these to take a positive value for every epsilon greater than zero, where well, that's a kind of comparative, comparative judgment that I make between variables. I expect this variable to take a higher value than this variable, even though there's no particular value that I expect it to take. Okay, but I'm not going to force that on you, just that's one route to being able to talk about your beliefs and being correct or incorrect. But I think really we can talk about 
correctness or incorrectness either way, okay? So have whatever utilities you like. There is still some set of almost desirable gambles that if you gave God your utilities, God would have, okay? So there are some ideal preferences to have given your utilities a fully informed agent would have those preferences. There, if you like the belief e model, or some ideal beliefs that God would have. And whichever way you go, you can fall short of God. And falling short of God, so we can we can try to figure out the ways in which you fall short of God. I'm not going to focus on moral character or anything like that. Um, but figuring out those types of errors that you can make that uh, that are what constitutes you falling short of God, we can try to pinpoint those and put numbers on those, and that's what we're going to input. Uh, we're going to use to construct our IQ scoring rules. So, what's all this God talk? Um, one, one crucial component of these IQ scoring rules is going to be the ideal set of desirable gambles in a world. So here, this is ideal, giving it your utilities. Um, what, what are the ideal preferences to have? Well, it's this guy, this guy right here. So the, at omega i, the ideal set of just almost desirable gambles is just the set of all, the, the half space, the set of all gambles that actually don't lose you utility in that world. Okay, that might be a silly set of desirable gambles to have given your evidence, but it's still the set of the de de desirable gambles that God would have in that world. That's what a form, fully informed agent in that world would have given your utilities. Okay. And if we're behaviorists, then this specifies the preferences of a fully informed agent with your utilities. If we're primitivists, it specifies the beliefs of a fully informed ag agent given a particular measurement scale. I mean, we can still use utilities as the things that we have beliefs about, um, or you can have gambles about quantities in some other state. Yeah. What is the distinguishment uh, uh, it's just it's just to point out that some people are comfortable talking about beliefs being true or false, correct or incorrect, and uncomfortable talking about over and above coherence preferences being correct or incorrect. So one way to get to the correctness talk is by treating them as beliefs. But I want to hopefully convince you that you can stick with your behaviorism and still make sense of this correctness or incorrectness. Paul just has a question of the two. Okay. I don't know whether one just wants to. Yeah, why don't just talk, Matthias? Uh, okay, do you hear me? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I had a question about a few slides back. Um, there was a, an example of gambles that were expressed in Celsius. And I was uh, slides, yeah, there, right there. And I was wondering um, how how do you interpret it, and and how does that exactly express a belief? So I interpret this as uh, as a beliefy analog of partial preference. So where you expect one variable to take a higher value than another variable, even though you don't expect it to take any. It's a comparative judgment that you make, even though you don't expect either of them to take, maybe. I mean, in the case of the status quo, then you do expect it to take a particular value, namely zero. Um, but I mean, think of, think of comparative belief, some of the, an imprecise probability model that we're all familiar with, and just extend that to, uh, extend that to non-indicator variables in the way that Suppies did. Uh, so some Suppy's representation theorems use extensions of this to, to integer value gambles, Suppy's and Zanotti. Um, that's the kind of thing I have in mind. So there, think of them as savage actions. I do something in different states of the world. Something happens, the temperature goes up, the temperature goes down. I might expect that action to raise the temperature. That is, take a, uh, these, are, these are marginal, uh, I'm thinking of this like in, in the same way that we're thinking of gambles as raising or lowering. Uh, okay. Yep. I'm thinking of it as raising or lowering uh, the temperature in this case. Okay. 
so it would, that, be, it would yeah so it yeah. would reflect my comfort or someone's comfort under those te temperature changes or something like that so yeah. i desire this or not is that yeah. what you think okay all right thank you good okay so here's a picture of the idea of gambles if we just if we're just thinking about gambles on heads or tails then in the heads world the perfect set of uh, almost desirable gambles all the stuff that pays out in that negative amounts on heads and in the tails world it's the set that pays out in non-negative amounts on tails. and then you can obviously see how this is going to scale up to five dimensions Okay, now there are two ways I said, or well, we can fall short of God. I claim there are two obvious ways we can fall short of God. Um, and they correspond to familiar notions of type one and type two error. So if this is your set of desirable gambles, then you've fallen short of God. This, and let's say we're in the heads world, we're in world one, then you've said that a bunch of stuff is almost desirable that God did it. You went on a limb, you said something false. It's type one error. You also failed to say that a bunch of gambles were desirable when God did. So you were silent about a bunch of stuff that God wasn't. That's a kind of type two error. Um, in hypothesis testing, uh, you, you, if you reject, reject a null hypothesis, and it turns out the null hypothesis is true. That's a type one error. You, you said something it is false. It turns out not to be false. You can also fail to reject the null hypothesis. That's not saying the null hypothesis is true. It's just being silent about whether it's uh, true or not. And if you're silent about it, uh, so you don't reject it, and it turns out to be false. That's a type two. Similar kind of thing, structurally similar kind of thing going on with desirability, which is why I import that terminology, even though maybe it's not the most, I don't know. I have, until I use type one and type two every day for so long, I always used to confuse them. Now it's sort of great, but maybe it's familiar enough to you that you always get it the right way around. If so, great. Um, so we did type one and type two for world one. Going to do the same thing for world two, the, the tails world. So in the tails world, it's this stuff out here that you said was desirable that God doesn't. That's your type one error. And it's this stuff over here that you've been silent about and God's not. That's your type two. Okay. Now that's just identifying regions that we're going to use to construct type one and type two error scores. Um, I'm going to say something a little bit more about how to do that. Uh, but let me give you a preliminary of why you might want to put real numbers on this. I mean, we're in precise probabilists. You might think, what's, what's the fascination with real numbers? Why are, why are you forcing us to use real value of scoring rules? Um, theoretically, it might not be the most, uh, might be the most satisfying way to go. No, there's done some work, the academy has done some work uh, thinking about this without numbers. But there are some advantages to using real value and scoring rules and some drawbacks uh, that crop up really pressingly in work by Teddy in 2012, where he provided some impossibility results for, uh, for scoring rules like the one I'm going to construct. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go forward. What we're going to see is kind of in a particular, given a particular construction of IP scoring rules, what the impossibility results that Teddy they proved how they manifest in this case and whether or not we think that's objectionable or or not. Uh, I think it's not objectionable. I think it's a kind of acceptable feature of the scoring rules rather than a bug, but I'm sure Teddy will have some things to say about that. Um, okay, so why uh, why go for real value scoring rules? I mean, we're, we're not going to quite have our scoring rules tell us the accuracy of any set of almost desirable gambles. We already have to tell us the accuracy of any coherent sets of desirable gambles, as well as all coherent ones. We're not actually going to consider all incoherent sets of almost desirable gambles, so it's not going to be fully general. But the basic idea is, like 
in the precise case, like what, what Ben was giving us, it's going to take a, a, a model, an IP model, a set of desirable gambles. It's going to take a world of two arguments, and it's going to return some number that is the penalty that that thing gets at the world. Um, and in some sense, it's going to measure the accuracy of that set of desirable gambles. Um, these are just loss functions, right? Loss functions like Breyer mean square error, like cross entropy of the sort that we're familiar with, except now we're, we're measuring the loss of IP models. Like those loss functions, these, I think, deserve the name. Uh, they deserve to be considered sort of elitic or truth-related loss functions because, well, they're going to be a function of type 1 and type 2 error. And those things seem truthy. Um, they capture the two ways that this set of gambles uh, diverges from the true or the ideal thing at the world. So it's a measure of distance to the truth in some sense. Um, and you get lower penalties for, for getting strictly less type one and type two error. So they're in a way truth directed as you move strictly closer to God. Get better and better, less and less of a penalty. If you don't like calling these things epistemic, I don't care. I mean, we're going to work with them. Um, so, why real values? Well, one thing which might be obvious, but um, you know, we're, we're used to thinking about gambles. Which gambles are better than which other gambles? Those are the kinds of judgments we, we trade in IP often. And this allows us real value scoring rules allow us to treat treat sets of desirable gambles themselves as a gamble, just a gamble that they, gives you a kind of loss, a loss in accuracy. Um, there's lots of work about this, but one nice one nice feature of doing that is then you get some reason about what kinds of properties sets of desirable gambles should have using pretty minimal assumptions. So I could, for example, we didn't talk about choice functions, so apology for the terminology here, but if I was had a choice set that included all the possible sets of desirable gambles, coherent or not, I might ask, well, what things should be rejected from that set? What stuff should I throw out? And I might want to do that just using a vacuous preference ordering. So I only throw out stuff when there's other things in the set that dominate that are guaranteed to be better. Um, well, then this, this scale that lets us turn these things into, into gambles lets us use that vacuous ordering over these accuracy gambles so that I, I reject something if there's another set of desirable gambles that's guaranteed to get a lower penalty. That's the kind of thing that happens in, in accuracy arguments for dominance arguments for probabilities. And we're going to try to do something similar here. So it lets us do some of the philosophy stuff that you may or may not be interested in, showing that pursuit, the rational pursuits of accuracy leads you to coherence, leads you to updating in the same way. But, I mean, which you might not think uh, is the whole story about why I like coherence, but you might think it's nice that we have pragmatic reasons to be coherent. And if we're just doing inquiry and we're just concer concerned about minimizing error, it leads us to the same place. convergence on, on the coherence axioms and rules for updating and so on. Uh, but there are other more practical reasons to care about scoring rules. Um, so consider the, the CDC's forecasting efforts during the pandemic. Uh, so every week, the CDC uh, uh, produced well, I mean, not every week, different types of forecasts were, were uh, produced at different uh, time steps. But uh, we had, as, as those of you, I'm sure all of us were following the numbers, uh, you, you kept track of the forecast for new cases each week or over the month for new hospital admissions and so on. And the CDC traded in, you know, so they gave upper and lower provisions for uh, the number of new cases in a particular time period, the number of uh, 
number of hospitalizations. That effort was run by the W group out of CMU. Originally, they had a bunch of teams put models into a forecasting hub, and they just averaged the predictions of all the models. Um, they were give, each of them were giving upper and lower provisions for these things. Uh, and then they learned a little bit, and in uh, November 2021, moved to a weighted ensemble. Um, and how they constructed that weighted ensemble was by looking at the past performance of everything in the forecasting hub, uh, scoring it using an IP scoring rule, a particular one called the weighted interval score, uh, in the 12 weeks prior to the forecast. And then the best performing models, the 10 best, get into the ensemble model. And not only are, is that used as a selection criteria which models get in, the most accurate ones, but also their weights were determined by their past performance according to the so I'll, I'll show you in a second when I show you the story. I mean, so the, the, the forecast were about case. The forecast, so these prediction intervals here, I say, are upper and lower provisions. They're being treated as upper and lower provisions. They're not being treated as Um At least the, the score that we're using to get people to report these things are not treating them as confidence intervals. They're treating them as upper and provisions. Um, how people then go on to use them is another question, but how they get into the model in the first cases as upper and provisions. Um, okay, so then their weights are also determined by their performance according to that score um, with models with a stronger record of accuracy receiving so what's that score? I'm just going to give you one of the interval scores. The weighted interval score does this at a bunch of uh, different uh, well, prediction interval uh, levels. Uh, this is one of the things that goes into that, that average and that is the weighted interval score. So what is it doing? So these, the people who are contributing, so the forecasting hub, contributing models to the forecasting hub, have a, a full distribution uh, over, I don't know if I included this here, so let's, I don't know, let's say this is hospitalizations and get any rate. Um, a full distribution and uh, the score there, but they're only being asked to give an upper and a lower provision. I'll, I'll say in a second why I think it's right next to the office, an upper and a lower provision. Well, how does the score work? Well, you get one penalty. You, part of the penalty is just the width of the interval. So you do worse the wider the interval goes. So in principle, you'd like to have it be as narrow as possible. Um, but you also get penalized when the true number of possible admissions for that week is outside of your interval. If it's on the lower end, then it just goes up linearly. And if it's on the upper end, same thing, it goes up linearly. So it's the further you get away from the upper or lower end, the more of a penalty you get. And this width thing is fixed. And depending on the slope of that line, the, the, peop, the models reporting the, the predicted distribution here will give different uh, narrower or wider forecasts. And in particular, these things are proper for the, in this case, 80% uh, prediction interval. What does that mean? It means they're gonna find the part of their distribution where there's 80% of the probability mass in that interval, and there's 10% on one side and 10% on the other, and then they're gonna report those, those numbers as the, the upper and lower bounds of the interval. Okay, now, Why, why is this not a confidence interval? Well, the way it's getting scored is on the, it, you're not just asking whether the true value of the parameter is in the interval, um, and then looking at how the frequency of correct or incorrect cases. Instead, you're getting a specific score on for each sample uh, that gets, it's not a yes or no answer. It's a measure of how 
uh, how far the true answer in some sense was from your interpretation. Um, and um, if you think of this as a utility distribution, um, these numbers, this, all of these people that are reporting, that are submitting these precise predicted distributions, they have a precise expected utility. Uh, but they're being incentivized to give something that's going to inform policymakers that they're going to use some decision procedure where they're not going to be able, they're not extracting that. So they're being incentivized to give some forecast that's not a confidence interval that's going to be used used to guide decision in roughly, well, I mean, who knows what policymakers are doing, but something like the way that upper and lower provisions are used. That's why I'm calling them upper and lower provisions. You might quibble with some of the details, but stuff like this is used in practice, and I think it is, uh, it's an important task for our community to think about how to construct these types of scoring rules well. Yeah. Well, yes. Yeah. Uh, Aggression. So, what we're calling what has been called today from scoring rules a focus on eliciting means of distribution. Yeah, not these ones. There's another class of scoring rules which are focused on eliciting quantiles of distribution. They have exactly this form. I mean, with loss functions and different slopes, and that gives. And so, rather than worrying so much over this word proper because of its laudatory character. Let's just agree we're talking about different kinds of scoring rules that elicit different aspects of distributions. Here you're eliciting, you're eliciting quantiles. Yeah, but, but my, I guess, I guess what I want to highlight here though is that yes, you're you're eliciting, you're eliciting quantiles, um, um, but you are eliciting something that is. Um, I mean, they specifically chose a weighted interval score because it's because it's proper for quantiles. I mean, you know, that's the, that's the whole motivation. But um, these things, uh, the numbers are being treated for decision purposes as upper and lower provisions. Um, I mean, so the, I guess the general point that I want to make is yes, I can. I can use scoring rules that are going to force you as a as a modeler to report things that are true about your distribution. But then what those things go on to be used as, and if I want to use them as upper and lower provisions, I can get things that kind of look relatively sensible, even though you don't think these things are upper and lower provisions. From your perspective, the modeler. They're just quantiles. From my perspective, I'm using this scoring rule to get imprecise probabilities from you, even though you don't have an imprecise probability. Um, um, so, so, is there a way we can interpret both the percentile number as a supreme fine class? No, I, I mean, <laughs> that can be used in something like that way, but not from the model perspective. Um, I thought we learned that a lot of provisions are supreme buying prices. Yeah, I mean, the, the only this is probably more of a digression than is necessary. The reason that I'm calling them provisions is because of how they're being, once they're handed off to a decision like a, a policy making body. How they're being used by that body. They are not upper and lower provision. They're not the modelers of upper and lower provisions. So, in that sense, it's wrong to call them upper and lower provisions. But there are two parties here, and one wants information from the other, and they're going to use that information in whatever way they see fit. And they're using this scoring rule to, to get some information from the modelers that they're, they're going to use in a way that the modelers would. Yeah, maybe I. <coughs> Just to make sure we understand the difference. So, the uh, confidence level is subjective. A confidence, if we call it a confidence interval, it's subjective. If we call it low, lower and upper level of provision, it's subjective. Huh? No, I mean, I think what I wanted to, the only distinction I wanted to make here is uh, between 
procedures that are meant to yield intervals that have the true value in them a certain frequency, a certain proportion of the time. Um, versus, um, that's one standard of evaluation. I can score you on how often uh, your interval, your, you have some procedure for producing intervals. I can say, well, I'm just getting the true value in there a certain percentage of the time. This is not functioning like this. Um, so the, the, the way that we're deciding, well, are you performing well, are you not? Do you get to be in the ensemble model or not? What weights you get is not by treating them as confidence. That's, that's all I meant to point out. Okay, we have, yeah, just to clarify the point. So what you're saying is, even though maybe you're the expert and you have like precise, so like your, your selling and buying price are, are the same, um, I'm requiring information from you, maybe a bunch of other people, uh, and I, I use it on files, but then I can set my setting my prices as well as the same uh, with the information. And yeah, that would be good. Right. that's the gist of it. Yeah, just what the, the, the logical form of what you want. So the normal provision is like, what are you exactly wanting to know? This, an order of pair. This, yeah, an order of pair. So the L and the U are the upper and lower provision, I'm calling them. They're not homologous upper and lower provision, but it's what the, what the interest group is going to use is an upper and lower provision. Um, and exit here is the true value of the variable that's being forecast. So the lower provision is at least something that, uh, uh, if I talk about the lower provision of a specific game, then take a pair of that game, take a number, it would have that. I don't see the logical form of a, a lower I mean, this is a single variable, number of possible admissions, and these are lower, I'm claiming for the, not for the modeler, but for the, for the stakeholder, the people that's using, that are using this information, treating this as the lower number provision of this single gamma. There's no, you know, we're not taking, there's no, the variable itself is not. I, I call it, you know you said the variable itself is the number. Of the no, the variable is the number of possible admissions in the next week or more provisions. I was thinking, okay, the lower provision would be something like maybe you want to pay what is it like 25 and one one? Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to. The lower is the number of something like. Or the category of lower. It's just, I'm, for each variable that I'm trying to forecast, I'm giving you an interval, say between 30 and 100, just over 100. Um, and that is, those are the bounds on my best estimate. That's not the, the, the net from the variables to set No, the net that takes in the variable and spits out. Uh, Think of it like an, an, an assessment that you can make. So it's not itself a lower, it's not itself a computer form of provision, but if, if these assessments are, are consistent, then they can be extended to. Now there's no procedure here for ensuring consistency. Um, yeah, I'm going to ask. Okay, but let's, I mean, I'm sure these kinds of issues will continue to crop up. I'm going to breeze through this. The point. I just need to point to a few more applications. You could use these more generally for aggregation purposes, for getting experts to report um, imprecise probabilities, even if they're not imprecise, and then maybe evaluating procedures for aggregating. Um, you could use it in, in prediction markets, so I can have markets yielding imprecise forecasts of some sorts. And then as a trader in the market, I can say, well, I'm willing to change the, the market prediction um, I'm going to incur the cost of the penalty that the status quo market prediction uh, gets whenever the data is reported. Um, as long as I, uh, as long as I, sorry, I get paid that bigger penalty. If I think I'm going to be able to improve the penalty, make it go down, I get paid the 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 penalty of the market forecast, and then I have to pay out uh, the penalty of my the, the change that I make to the market. One could 
could use IP scoring rules in that way. One could use them in medicine for IP expert systems, which exist. And we are going to focus on training the neural net using them. So it's, that's the application of interest for us. Um, one quick point about methodology, not to harp on this. Um, I think it's a non-starter. So what I said what we're going to try to do is see what kind of scoring rules are implicit in the coherence axioms that we already know and love. I don't think we want to just start by laying down some kind of mildly plausible list of properties that we want these things to have. Um, that's likely to give us garbage, likely absolute value score. Instead, we should do the hard work of figuring out which IP scoring rules hang well together with the stuff with the stuff we know and love about IP. Otherwise, we're going to incentivize forecasters to re report incoherence in precise probabilities and neural net classifiers to learn incoherent things. We want to we want to make sure that they're, they're able to undergird, incentivize uh, at least coherence. Okay, so. I'm going to tell you what these things are now in a, a bit more detail. We're going to do some exercises and then I'm going to tell you some preliminary results. All of this stuff can be improved. This is not a sort of well established field. This is an area where the axioms that I give you surely need to be tweaked. The results can be generalized. There are lots of extensions to make. So, uh, I mean, treat this as the early stages of a kind of research program. All right. To rehash one of the components is this perfect set of almost desirable gambles. And you all seem roughly on board with these being kinds of type one and type two errors that you can make. Um, here's how we're gonna put a number on type one error. Um, we're gonna look, so if this is your set of desirable gambles, we're going to look at that region that we pointed to, the stuff that you said was desirable that's not in the perfect set. And then this thing is going to be a penalty function uh, that is going to tell us how bad it is to make different, to, to misclassify different gamble's, and then we're going to average it. That's it. I mean, this is structurally quite similar to what Shervish. Uh, the, the Shervish form of strictly proper scoring rules. These things, like like when I was, say, looking at the score of my probability for uh, for rain when it doesn't rain. Um, these things are my probability is just going to be a, the, the bound of an integral, and then there's going to be something that we're integrating that's telling you how bad uh, how bad different things in a range are. Similarly, uh, my set of desirable gambles are going to give me. We're going, to, we're going to see this more carefully. They're going to give me just boundaries on this integral, um, and then there's some penalty function inside. So what is this phi i thing? Uh, it's it's the thing that's telling us how bad it is to mis misclassify gambles uh, in the type one way or the type two way. And they're going to have some properties. I'm going to give you an axiomization of these things, uh, a set of axioms for them in a second. But they're going to have properties like um, the penalty should be positive when it actually, the penalty at a world, so there's going to be a different one of these things for each world. It's going to, it should be positive when it actually uh, is desirable, almost desirable. <laughs> um, just in case that. So for for things that gambles that lose me utility, lose me money, uh, negative phi i is going to be the type one penalty for falsely judging this gamble desirable when it's not. Let me give you an example. I have some gamble here to make money, uh, pays out in one world, doesn't pay out in another one. Let's say I think it's almost desirable. 
Uh, but in fact, it loses me two quid. I don't win anything, it costs two quid to buy. Uh, so it's not in the perfect sense of desirable gambles. Um, my type one error is going to be negative by I. My type one error for big misclassifying big money is going to be negative by I. This is making this negative is just to make the we're gonna we're gonna see, we're gonna need to look at uh, um, functional derivatives later on is just to make those a bit nicer to work with. And then Fi averages these errors according to some measure. I'm going to assume this is a nice measure. This is some place where surely there's much more generality to be had. Um, I'm going to just assume it's defined on the Borel sigma algebra um, of Rn, the smallest sigma algebra containing all the open hypercubes. I'm going to assume it's finite. I'm going to assume it's absolutely continuous with the product of a measure. So basically, I just want finite stuff. I want these, these integrals not to explode. Um, that's really all I'm doing here in this absolute continuity assumption, because when we do this in, Py in, in Python, we're just going to have to do indefinite, you know, iterated indefinite integrals. So I need to be able to just extract a mass function and, and use integrated definite integrals. The reason I do this is because when we're doing some problem sets with these, integrating in this sort of general form lets us do the problem sets in a way where we're just doing kind of baby set theory with the domains uh, on bottom. That's the reason. Okay, type two error is similar, except here I'm looking at the stuff that God said is the gambles that God said are desirable that I was silent about. And then this is a penalty that I get for that misclassification. I'm averaging this. Okay, so if they, if I don't think don't judge big money desirable as I surely would it in real life, and it turns out that was a winning ticket, well then that's in God instead of almost desirable gamble. So I made a kind of mistake, and this phi i is going to tell me how bad that classification error is. And we're just averaging those, and then we're we're summing the type one and type two errors, and that's our that's our IP story. Okay. Uh, is there any reason why you would value type one and type two errors? The same. We're not valuing them the same um, because the penalty function can behave very differently for type one and type two errors. In fact, that's exactly what the, the problems that we're about to do are going to highlight. Um, this summing is a way of disintegrating over this whole region, but that tells us nothing about the comparative how bad the penalties are for type one errors and how bad the penalties are for type two errors. Okay. So this is the first exercise. We get to do something. Um, suppose that the only thing we care about, we don't get any penalty for type two error. We only get penalties for saying false things. So my inaccuracy score at world one is just the type one error, which is just given by this. And same thing at world two. And all we're going to need to assume here is that the penalty is positive, it, it is not negative when, uh, yeah, it, it's not negative when the thing pays out. So phi one is going to be uh, somewhere over here. Um, uh, if this is a function of x, uh, for any y value, uh, when x is positive, it's going to take a value over here. And when x is negative, it's going to take a value over here. Ditto for world two. That's the only thing we're assuming about those. And what I want you to show is that, and you can do this just by looking in the graph, show that the vacuous set of almost desirable gambles, that is the set that just contains the positive orthids, strictly dominates this set of desirable gambles. It's guaranteed to be better. Let's take a few minutes just to talk amongst yourselves. I mean, if 
will be pretty straightforward probably, uh, but make sure you understand why that's the case. So we're also assuming that our measure is positive on every non-degenerate region. So it can be zero on lines, but if you have a, a region that's not just a line, it's giving positive measures of that region. Should we should we talk through it? Yeah, okay. So let's start by looking at the inaccuracy of the vacuous model at both worlds. So world one, here's the perfect set of almost desirable gambles. And here is the vacuous model. Is there anything that is in the vacuous model that's not in the perfect set of almost desirable gambles at world one? No, there's nothing. Okay, so, uh, so that type one penalty is zero. And in world two, the perfect set of almost desirable gambles this. Again, is there anything that's in the vacuous model that's not in the perfect set of almost desirable gambles? No. So perfect, our vacuous model is perfectly accurate in both worlds. What about D? Is D, I mean, the only way this could fail is if D was perfectly accurate in both worlds. Is, it, is that gonna be true? Well, in world one, we've got this region out here that is not in the perfect set of desirable gamma, which is over here. And we assumed that phi takes a negative value in this region. 
and it's it's not not it's not non-negative. So they both have to be negative. And we assume that mu, our measure, assigns not assigned non-zero measure to this region since it's a non-degenerate region. And so this, because it's this is taking a negative value, and we just canceled out that 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 negative up there. This is taking a positive value uh, in world one. And the same for world two, because there's in world two, here's the perfect set of almost desirable gambles. And we have this little region now here uh, that is not in that set. <coughs> That all makes sense, yeah. So you've written the matrices as the cones of truncates, but yeah, they're not. They're not. Why do I believe that any one of these cones has bound zero value? I just, I just uh, am using measures that are making examples. So I'm, I'm not seeing why that's the case because I've got unbounded utilities going out, unbounded losses. I mean, there are lots of there are lots of measures that will do that for you. I mean, if you take uh, if you take the you know the products of the mass function of normal distribution. So. That's your that's the mass function for the measure. I mean, there are, yes, it's a restriction. On, it's a serious restriction on the type of measure that we're using that makes these things possible. And I should say. Okay. Also, though, in this case, it doesn't matter because they're undoubtedly negative, right? And so it would still have to compare different equations and the way of saying the angle there, which is intuitively supposed to represent a larger loss. If it's in, if, if, if one region of that cone going out gets infinite, then making it bigger still makes it infinite. You don't get to right, but, but because in this case, right, because the doctors have zero loss. Like if you have any, yeah, I mean, it would be dominated in a silly well, I mean, yeah, just, right. but it wouldn't be able to distinguish anything, which is why I'm using measures that don't do that. Um, I mean, that, that was the point of, of the restriction of, of measures to be nice uh, in that way. And when we're doing this in machine learning application, we are actually just going to use truncated regions because we're only there comparing, um, comparing coherent models to some of the other. We can make the distinctions we want to make. Uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, take the point. You need you're working with a with with a pretty seriously restricted set of measures here that are gonna make these things not blow up to be infinite. And once they do blow up to be infinite, then you're not gonna be able to make most of the comparisons that you want to make. Um, so you need to work with with measures that make these angles fine. Um, so we we we'll get to the Similar constraint on the by i that they can only in a very restricted way depend on the i. Uh, yeah, I, I think it would be a, a similar to the constraint uh, we had earlier. Uh, we measure uh, the <coughs> inaccuracy for precise probabilities where it could only depend on the true value of the conditions that work. That would be analogous, right? Uh, sorry. Okay, so as we have it for now, the phi can depend in very complex ways on the subscript phi on uh, what we have yeah. uh, value for what we yeah. um, assume true. Um, in, um, in, in, the, in the inaccuracy, sorry, in the, in the ways of scripting prop, probably. Of measuring um, inaccuracy in the precise case, they are we add that uh, um, only way in which the omega i enters into the um, accuracy score um, of the function at the word was in determining the valuations of the propositions, basically, and determining the true values of the propositions. Um, yes, and so that seems to be a more restricted way in which the uh, Inaccuracy score at the word can be negative on the word in the precise case. And then okay. here we have, a, as of now, a very general. general. Yeah. And then we will impose further restrictions. restrictions and 
to get the dominant stuff to work, I'm going to have to assume that these phi's yeah. integrate in a certain way. They live in LP space. I need people that are smarter than me to help see how far, how much more general these things can be made, but we'll see that. We're going to put some restrictions on it. Not going to be as tight as the restrictions in the precise case. Um, and then the dominance results are going to require even further restrictions, which are clearly technical. I mean, here yeah, we had some constraints on that. Yeah, here we have minimal constraints. Yeah. Okay. I want to move on to another exercise. Um, that is a little more complicated. So what did this show us? Um, it showed us if we only care about type one error, that is motivating us to be fully imprecise, at least when we're just comparing the current models. Um, there's a way you can, you can run this that gets you the vacuous model being better than any of your models as well. Um, now I want to go the other direction and show you that when we treat them the same, this was a question that came from over here somewhere. Um, when we treat type one and type two error, that's pushing us in the other direction. It's pushing us toward motivating precision. Um, so suppose that we're treating them analogously so that the penalty that I'm getting um, for a type one error is just the utility that I that I've lost by, you know, if I were to actually accept that gamble, it's the utility that I lost by accepting a, a, a gamble as desirable, but is in fact not desirable. And here, the type one penalty, the type two penalty is just the utility that I left on the table. And same in world two. So say we treat type one and type two error exactly analogously in this specific way. Um, then let's consider the set of uh, a precise model, the set of desirable gambles determined by the probability of p here for heads. Um, so it's going to be all the gambles with non negative expectation according to p. That's the red region. So p is, p is this half space, closed half space. I want you to fill in this table. So I've done it, done the type one errors at world one for. Uh, for D, which was the same set of desirable gambles that we used last time, and for our precise model, um, what we're doing here is just looking at here, I've labeled these regions A, B, and C, P, Q, and R, uh, figure out the domains of integration that give us the type one and type two error in each of these cases. The red, the red is this precise model. It's this, this, the, this closed half space. What was S? What is S? Uh, sorry, S is the type two error. The reason I chose F and S here is F is saying false things and S is saying silent. When anybody thinks they have it, just give them a little thumbs up from the crowd so they can get a sense of how it's going.
Take another 30 seconds and then I'll launch. All right, let's look at the table since we want to get some of the, the basics, basic results about these things uh, in place. Okay, so uh, our, our imprecise set of desirable gambles um, in world one, uh, what's the stuff that God said was desirable that I did not? Well, it's all this stuff in the region P, U, and Q. And the precise model, it says a bit more than me, so it's only the stuff in me. That's the stuff that God says is good that I don't. And is that okay? We're moving on to world two. Type one error. Remember, world two is this closed half space up here. So what is the stuff that I have said wrong um, that I said was desirable with my imprecise model that, that God didn't? It's the stuff in this sliver here. Everything up here is fine. This is the stuff that I said wrong. What about the precise model? Well, the precise model said a lot more than me, so it gets a lot a lot more type two, sorry, type one error here. It's all the stuff in Q union R. That's all the stuff that's not in there. And finally, what if I failed to say that I should have with my imprecise model? Well, it's the stuff in this A region. That's the stuff that's in the perfect set. It's not in my set. And here, uh, it's A union B for the successful. That's the stuff that's in the perfect set. It's not in that set. Okay, so that's that's why I'm doing it in this more general way for these problems. It's just a baby set theory. If you were doing this with bounded integrals, this would be a mess. Like if we were doing iterated indefinite integrals. Okay, now write down this table. I'll flip back and forth between it. But do you have this table written down? So I want you to reference it. So. I'll come back in a second for people that don't quite have it yet. Oh. Um, now use that table that you had to tell me the difference between the type one and type two errors at the respective worlds of our two models. So here it was the difference between these, this minus this, we're integrating the same thing, uh, but we're taking out the penalty that you get in region C. Uh, so we're just integrating over region B. Do that for the rest of them. You will, at the end of this, have proved a particular instance of something general about these kinds of sort. Does anyone 
us. Anybody want to shout out the region of immigration for the next one? Arthur. Q. Oh, I did them all at once. Uh, it's Q. Why is that? Well, if we go back to the previous page, we're integrating over the union Q. We're integrating the same thing over P, so we're just subtracting the penalty that we get in that P region, we're left with Q. And same thing uh, is happening for world two. Okay, I'm gonna push through because we're very short on time. Um, maybe, maybe we'll just talk through this part instead of leaving it as an exercise. Um, but now we can look at the uh, expected difference between the inaccuracy of the precise model and of the, the other model. Um, what do we get when we do that? Um, so let's look at here, this one first. Um, we already have F1, the difference between them up there. So let me just write that out. Um, it's P. Uh, we're just gonna take that second, second term. Um, Okay, now <clears throat> what happens? Um, when we rearrange these terms, well, these are the same region. Uh, so I can collect those up and then P here is just a constant. Um, so I can push that inside the integral. So I can write this as Q, um, sorry. We want this to be greater than or equal to zero. Let me put one of them on one side of the inequality and the other on the other side of the inequality. Uh, so let me, um, yeah, let me put the cues over here. Um, so I'm gonna put the cues on this side and then I have Px plus, uh, Sorry, I'm not doing this right, am I? I want those. I want the I want the piece on this side. Sorry. So px plus one minus p y d mu. And on this side, I'm integrating over the Q region, and I have px plus one minus p y d mu. And now what is special about the q region? Well, q over here is on one side of the p hyperplane. So all of the gambles in that region, p is going to expect to be positive or not negative anyways. So this integral is going to be greater than or equal to zero. And on this side, we have B, and that's the stuff on the wrong side of the hyperplane. So all the gambles in there, P is going to expect to have a negative value. Uh, so this is going to be less than zero. And so P is going to expect itself to get a better score than this other set of desirable gambles. Um, relative to this score. And as soon as you're not, that's going to be true more generally. When you set 
type one and type two error uh, to be equal in this way, you see them as unequal footing, then you get a strictly proper story. As long as the, the measure is uh, nice, so not floating up to infinity and giving positive measure to every non degenerate region. Strictly proper for precise. For precise. By that, I mean every precise thing will expect itself to be best. And that'll turn out actually to make all of the precise things, the only ones that are non-dominated. Okay, I am going to um, leave the axiomization as notes for you to peruse. Um, they are relevant for understanding for the proofs of the propositions that follow, but I want you to get a sense of what we can do with these things. Um, and the full, the full axiomization, A, probably will need to be, I mean, here it is, but probably need to be tweaked some of the boundary, or, you know, whether it's strictly or weakly increasing and where it will need to be uh, adjusted. Um, but we're going to look at a special case of this for the machine learning application. So remembering this in general is not going to be important. Okay. So let me tell you what we can do with these things. So our IP scoring rules are then going to take the integral form that we had, and then the, the penalty functions are going to have some additional properties. They're going to be positive, positive homogenous, uh, super additive. At each world, a gamble that pays out nothing at that world is going to give you no penalty. Um, it's going to be a strictly increasing function of the uh, of the money that you leave on the table in that world. And, and so it's going to look something like this. Fix the other values of the gamble. Look at the penalty as a function of xi when you're in world i. It's going to look something like that uh, so that we're taking the negative of this to get the type one error, can the super additivity means this is going to have to be a concave function, given that it's positive homogeneous, uh, and it's going to be positive over here. Um, and that just that's just telling us that we're getting positive penalties for type two error, and we're getting positive penalties for type one error, and at most we can have these things. This be a straight line. Um, that's the case where we end up back with strictly proper scoring rules. Okay, I'm sorry that that was brief, but I do want to give you a sense of how this hangs together with the coherence axioms. This is the special case that we'll get, we're going to look at later. Uh, so where uh, where um, lambda and gamma just give us. The slope of these lines, these are lines in this case. Um, it's not some more general kind of concave function. And the, the penalty at a world doesn't depend on anything else other than the payoff that it So no, no dependence on the other arguments. Um, OK, uh, I might need to skip over the details of this. But the basic question, the basic approach to thinking about coherence with IP scoring rules um, is going to be, first, we're going to look at, uh, at the boundary of sets of desirable gambles. So that the set, we've got some curve, some nice curve, and the set of desirable gambles are all the gambles above the curve. Uh, those are epigraphical sets. And then the boundary is the thing that is defining the epigraph. Um, and the basic question for us will be, I look at the boundary of some maybe incoherent set of desirable gambles like that. Can I bend it? Can I nudge it in a way that is guaranteed to improve accuracy? And it will turn out that if we use these scoring rules, anytime it's incoherent, you can always nudge it in a way bend the boundary a little bit in a way that's guaranteed to improve accuracy, improves accuracy in every world, in lower loss in every world. And, um, and 
for a given set of story rules, there's going to be some class of coherent models that are the ones that are admissible relative to that story. Some, not the whole set of models, not every coherent model, but for different story rules, they're going to carve up the space uh, of coherent models uh, into classes that are admissible relative to this scoring rule, admissible relative to this scoring rule, and so on. Um, it's useful to kind of think of how this argument goes on an analogy with uh, an argument by Lindley in a paper called The Inevitability of Probability. Um, this is not Lindley's exact argument. Lindley isn't using strictly proper scoring rules there. Uh, this is just teasing out some of the things that to Lindley are too basic to say out loud. Um, but for, for applying it to the IP case, it's good to be explicit about what's going on. So say I have precise probabilities for heads and tails, but they're incoherent, it's 0 0.2, 0 0.4. Um, then I can nudge this guy toward 0 0.4, 0 0.6 in a way that's guaranteed to improve accuracy. Um, so I can add a little bit of this vector, 0 0.2, 0 0.2, um, to our original vector, and that'll give me a nudge toward 0 0.2, 0 0.4. And when I'm looking at the gradient of my scoring rule, well, that's telling me the rate of change in the loss with these, with these little nudges, okay? And the gradient takes this fairly, or, sorry, this directional derivative. Um, and the directional derivative takes this nice form, you just take the thing that you're nudging toward and you take the, the inner product with the gradient. Um, so in the end, it just looks like this. Um, and I think it's easiest to do this with, with an example, or sorry, with a, with a graph. We were gonna do an example to show how this works generally. But what's going on here is um, when I evaluate the gradient, the partial derivatives in each direction, which is the vector with the partial derivatives in it, uh, at this incoherence point, the gradient at world zero sits over here. The gradient at world one sits over here. And in that case, I can just plot the line through zero, and it puts both of those gradients on the same side of the line. This is a, this is a hyperplane. And in that case, all of the things on lines on this side of this that are parallel to this line going through zero, they all get increasingly big values, in this case, for, for 2, 2, when these things are positive. And all the things on lines descending away from that get negative value. And so it doesn't actually matter. I, I put these on the same line here, but it doesn't actually matter that the, these are, we could have picked a different thing going through zero that didn't put that on a line that's parallel. It doesn't matter. Um, but what happens then is when I, when I can do that, um, then that, that line tells me how to, I mean, that line basically specifies this AB, which is the directional derivative of my nudge, this point in the direction of this other point. And it, it tells me uh, a place that I can nudge that toward uh, that is gonna make both of these things, the directional derivatives, take a negative value. So, I can, when I can do that, when I can put them on the same side of the line, then there's a way I can nudge them away, away from where they currently are, that is guaranteed to improve accuracy. And it turns out I can do that just in case when I look at the positive cone um, generated by these two, the gradients at these two points, or sorry, these two gradients evaluated at this point, when zero isn't in that positive column, then I can plot a line through zero and so I put them both on the same side. So this gives me a test for when I can nudge them in a direction that is guaranteed to improve accuracy. It gives me a condition. 
And then when we chose it, I mean, the, the reasoning when we just said that, and when you do this, um, basically, the only time you can't put them on the same side is when they're on a line that goes through, uh, goes through the origin. And in that case, if these are strictly proper scoring rules, that only happens when they're, um, when they're probabilities. So whenever they're not probabilities, you can nudge them in a way that's guarantees and prove them. Now, and I'll, I'll stop here so we can have lunch just to give you the, the general character of this result. When we're working with IP scoring rules, we can do something similar, but everything calculus turns into calculus of variations. So we're going to have to do functional analysis, which is annoying at best at the top of my paper. Um, but where we were looking at directional derivatives over here, we have a similar kind of tool in functional analysis. These are called first, first variations. And basically, we're asking whether this boundary, which is now a function rather than it's a point, whether there's a way I can perturb it uh, that is guaranteed to improve this. And over here, where I have a gradient, now I have this thing inside this integral, and that's a functional derivative. Um, to actually do these things analytically, we need you know, Euler Lagrange kind of stuff. Um, but it's in principle doable. And the same kind of argument applies. We can, at least under certain conditions, we can nudge, we can bend our boundary in a way that is guaranteed to improve accuracy, just in case when I look at the cozy of these um, of these functional derivatives, zero is not in that cozy. So we want zero to be in the cozy. And then figuring out when zero is in this cozy um, is tantamount to figuring out which things are not locally dominated relative to this model, relative to this set of scoring rules. So I will end there. Let me just say, as I was saying before, the, what we see is that for different scoring rules, um, they're going to give us back classes of admissible models. They're never going to give us back the whole space. This is a kind of lesson that you might have anticipated from Teddy's impossibility results. Um, this is how it manifests for us. Uh, one last, very last thing to say is you might be concerned. Um, what happens if I am living on one of these slices of bread and then I learn something? Do I have to go off the slice of bread? That'd be bad. No, uh, with some caveats, conditioning, at least in the form that we, not the form that Eric mentioned on day one, but the form where you restrict the sample space and you condition, keeps you on the same piece of bread. Okay, so. Does this hang to, together well enough to be a class of scoring rules we're investigating? I hope so, but there's lots of more work to do. We're, we're going to put the theory to the side after lunch, though, and come back and look at an application. So, okay.